You know, I really love the Word of God, and I think the Word of God can change your life. What you're about to hear today is one of those life-changing messages that I believe inspires people. It's down-home, what I call down-home grits, and helpful. So enjoy today's message, and watch it change your life. Repeat the topic with me today, please. Say, dealing with my real issues. Now, in your notes, it says tough issues. No, it says real issues, right? On the graphic, it says tough issues. I'm, I, I, I communicated it to the staff, and God anointed them because they gave me a new thought. They really did. They did. I, I, in my mind, it was real issues, but in honesty, it should be real tough issues. It should be, and I'm going to change it to real and tough issues. It should be both. When I saw the word tough in the graphic, I thought that's perfect. Because there are issues sometimes that you have in your life that you try to ignore, but everybody else can see them. It, it's, 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 and it's real, but it's not real to you. You have become used to it, and it doesn't even stand out to you anymore. What are your real issues? That's what this sermon is about. The real issues that... Anybody around you long enough or for over a certain period of time could identify. So they think that's their issue, but that's not their issue. Their issue is something that they are ignoring. Everybody can see it. But they are totally oblivious, completely oblivious to what's obvious. Now... Some of you are going, why you got that mouse up there? <laughs> what, 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 what is that about? We had a conversation the other day with a friend. And the friend said to me, we were talking about this, this, this whole topic. And um, it, 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 it made him want to cry. It did just make you want to cry. It just made <laughs> you just sometimes you, you think about your real issues and Tears come to your eyes and you don't know what to say. And my friend, when he was talking about this, he said to me, it's the elephant in the room. Whenever you talk about some real issues, it's, everybody knows it. There are three real issues I'm going to talk about, three tough issues. Repeat them with me, please, over the next three months. You ready? Um, say sexual issues, sexual issues. relationship issues. Vocational issues. So we're going to talk later on about your job, work ethic, all that stuff down the road. We're going to talk about your friendships, not just dating relationships, your marriages. We're going to talk about all that next month. But this month, we're going to talk about sexual issues. And I'm going to do it for four weeks. Now, by the way, this is a sidebar. There is a series I did a few years ago called Bedroom Blindness, if you remember that. And uh, I put it up on the website. You can go get it again. On the app, if you click on the app. Um, and if you go to the, the church website, if you go to where the sermons are, Sermons on Demand, there's an area now called the Best of Pastor Rick. Can you say that with me, please? Come on. The Best of... When you get to the area that's the Best of Pastor Rick, I put in there all four of the Bedroom Blindness series for free. If you, are, if you go to my personal website where I keep a bunch of my stuff, rickytemple.com, R-I-C-K-Y temple.com, click on Video Audio, and you'll see a pull-down menu will come up. It will say the best of Pastor Rick. Click in it, and it will give you that same choice. So you can go listen to those sermons. Those are great. I listened to some of them because I thought they were great. I wanted to make sure I didn't say the same thing again. And so you can go. It's really cool. You just don't want Those are great sermons. I like them a lot. Now, having said that, when my friend made this comment to me as we were talking through the sermon, and he said, he said it is the elephant in the room, but I don't have an elephant. I had a mouse. <laughs> How many of you noticed me when I came in with it? Raise your hand. If you saw the mouse, raise your hand. Right? Raise your hand if you saw it and you, and you said, okay. Look, look how many people saw it. Okay. What did you think when you saw it? What did you say? What is he going to do with the mouse? What is he going to, what else? And you went like this. What else, what else do you think? What did you think? Talk to me. Raise your hand. It's a prop. Okay. Right? You figured that out. Good. Yeah. What else? You thought my granddaughter was over there, and I was okay. <laughs> Somebody else, what do you think? Yes. You thought it was going to be interesting. But you, all, you noticed it. Now, imagine K 
carrying something around like that all the time and thinking nobody sees it. That somehow, when I came in the room, when I came out of the office and people saw it, they all just said, okay, you're up to something. And I went in the media suite like I normally do. I greet everybody because all the digital people are watching. So I go and greet the media team first. And, you know, and I go, hey, guys, you know, I'm wearing this together. You know, you know, and they looked at me like, okay. They all erupted in laughter when I walked in the room. Like, what are you up to with the mouse? I said, it's, it's nothing. And then when I sat it here and started to preach, you would like, okay, are you going to explain the mouse? Or are you just going to let this mini mouse sit up here and um, not tell us why? Now, no matter how I try to preach, if I didn't stop and deal with this issue, you would spend most of the sermon going, what's the mouse got to do with it? (laughs) It's distracting. It's sitting up in here. And let me tell you, in your life, your intimate, and I want to change the term a little bit so that it's a little bit easier. Intimate issues. I won't say sexual issues over and over again. So let me just call it intimate issues, okay? Everybody with me? Say amen. Amen. Uh, the, The reason... If you don't deal with your, the reason you need to deal with your intimate issues is because on your job, people who interact with you, this is the impact, impact they have. Every time they talk to you, brother, you're looking them up and down, you're gawking, it stands out. It's not hidden. You can see the mouse. Sister, it's not hidden. It, it, and and you know, what I, what's interesting is, Men and women kind of gawk differently, you know? They, they, they carry it differently. Guys are really obvious, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's really, really obvious to them because they look up and they're down. And it's, it, they can't seem to get away from the idea that everybody noticed that. Hey, girl. <laughs> Glad to have you join the company. Everybody knows it. In every meeting, comments, things you say. And then if you're a woman, now women are a little bit more ninja about it. <laughs> a woman can look you up and down and not even look down. She can just, her, just, she got this, I don't know. She can just, and then size up where you work, what you make and everything. She got it all figured out really fast. <laughs> They're, 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 they are, they are, they are, they're analysts. They're, they're ways they analyze things. The way they perceive is just, it is a gift from God. But for some of you who think that nobody knows and nobody sees, it's that visible. They may never tell you, but it's that visible. And to help you with the sermon, do me a favor. Take my friend, because for the rest of the message, that's all they're going to think about. Thank you, sir. If you got the point, say amen. Amen. Can you give the Lord a big hand clap to that, if you got the point? I want to talk about your intimate issues, and I want to do it in a a way where I ask you to focus on one big question. What kind of decisions are you making in your intimate life? How do you manage it? On a day-to-day basis, what are you doing about this area of your life? Don't pretend it doesn't exist. Christians get on my nerve with that whole thing. It's almost like you don't want to admit, I, I, have, I have issues in this area. I love the comment that someone made to me that I thought was profound. It was a young girl. She says, I don't know if I can be consistently faithful to anybody, Pastor Ray. I am not sure. Even in marriage, I'm not positive. I told her what a courageous thing to say because she was honest. It is my conviction that in the church we are prone to be dishonest. We hide behind religious terms and language, and you'll see as I talk about this how that works. So let me give you my big thought. I'm going to spread it out a little bit. Here's what my goal is not. Ready? Has the effort to live pure in your life created an unhealthy, shaming, female bashing, and male judging culture? There is a lot of female bashing, and when this topic comes up, we make women seem like they're the guilty people, tempting everybody. And then we have this male bashing culture where it's almost, okay, the guys are you know, all bad and dogs and whatever, out of control. 
And from a religious sermon, it normally sounds like that, one way or the other. Uh, the, the desire to have an intimate guard, have intimate, what call, I call intimate guardrails, uh, is taught in the Bible. That you cannot do everything. Now, let's be clear. I know that if I look at the numbers statistically, a lot of people disagree with me when I say that. The, the doctrine that even a lot of Christians hold to is there are no boundaries. As long as I love you, you love me, it doesn't matter what I do. And I understand that. I made a, I made a point this week to read several books uh, in the last couple of weeks that deal with this issue and that disagree with me. I didn't want to read about anybody who thought I was right. And the basic, and a lot of them were written by, by people who are Christian, at, but who believe that sex prior to marriage or adultery is really okay as long as you don't hurt anybody and all the other things that they say that justify it. And I understand that that's their position, but I don't believe that's the Bible position. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I don't believe that we should be bashing people. If you disagree with me, it's okay. We don't have to, you know, be enemies. We, I believe there's something powerful about a dialogue. And so what I want to do is have a dialogue with you a little bit. We should avoid, I believe, however, de- uh, developing a culture of shaming those who struggle managing the, the intimate side of their life. You should not feel like you are being shamed. So if, if you say, well, Pastor, I, I've tried to be more restrained in my intimate life. I've tried to be consistent but I'm having trouble. You should not be a shamed person. We should have more than one message when it comes to intimacy. It shouldn't be, don't do it. One message that says, don't fornicate or commit adultery. That's all we say. Many people have never heard their pastor say anything positive about sexual intimacy at all. They've only heard negative stuff. That's all. and, And it's because, you know, we tend to do that as preachers. We just, you know, throw off on people. So if you're struggling or if you are confused, if you just have genuine questions, I grew up in a culture that didn't say this was not a part of your daily life. I was taught it was. It was a part of expressing love. And so that's where I grew up. So I'd had no points of reference up until I was 15. I didn't know what the word fornication even meant. I said, forna what? Oh, that's wrong? Why? That was my genuine question. I didn't mean anything by it. I just didn't have a cultural background that said that's wrong. They told me don't bring babies home. I kind of had to figure that out, but that's what I was told. So here's an important warning, though, I want to give you. And this is important. It's a warning. It's true. Physical intimacy is a powerful tool God has given us that reaches into our future, our finances, and the foundation of our lives. It affects your future, your finances, and your foundation. Can you say those three? Come on. Your future your finances, and your foundation. It can wreck it all. It's, it's a powerful tool. It can single-handedly change, oh man, all of your options. But if used properly, it can bring great joy to your life. Now I'm going to tell you something that's going to make you uncomfortable, okay? When I say this, buckle up. Don't get nervous for me, okay? Okay? I'm okay before I tell you this, all right? My mother had me as a single parent. She's gone on to be with the Lord now. She died in 1999, but be clear. I am the product of a single parent relationship. I told you would be okay. Hang with me, okay? I can't tell your story so I can tell mine, but I want to make this real to you. That decision and that intimate moment changed all of her options. Now, I'm a pretty good result, I hope, right? But this wasn't the plan that she had for her life. But it reached into her life as a sophomore in college and changed all of her options. Because there was not the infrastructure to support a child and college. So everything changed. For her. That's amazing. Now to me, that's why I told you, I told you, I told you I'm okay. But I'm just trying to make a point to you. It doesn't affect everybody evenly. Intimate choices affect people differently. 
And sometimes you don't see it on both sides of it. You don't understand the dynamic power of that decision. Young lady, look at me. They're lying to you. They're making you believe it doesn't matter. Here's what they tell you. Since the 70s especially, birth control will come along and you think, oh, it doesn't matter. No. No. You've been lied to. Let me just say this is a quick thing for our disprove that. It's more than just a physical issue or a baby issue. It's an emotional issue. It redefines you. It redefines all of your options. All of them. I want to prove something to you. It's not in your notes. I'll probably give it to you later. Um, I, these are my little addendum notes, okay? I'm about to get really smart, so the specs go on. I want to make sure I read this right. This is a, the, the three studies I, I did, three studies I looked up, and I thought they were fascinating. And I call it how many single lives, how many single people's lives are changed by one decision. Not two, one decision. This is a study done in 1976. When was this study done? Since 1970, the study said, out of wedlock birth rates have soared. In 1965, 24% of black infants and 3.1% of white infants were born to single mothers. By 1990, the rates had risen to 64% for black infants. Just pause. Birth control and all. Pause. 18% for whites. Every year, every year, about one million more children are born into fatherless families. Wow. Staggering. Another study done in 2015. Quote, more than, this is 2015, we have gone ahead several years. Are you with me? 2015. More than three quarters of African American births are to unmarried women. Nearly double the illegitimacy rate of all other births by the time we get to 2015. 2018. What year did I just say? About 70% of black children and more than half of Hispanic children and somewhere around 30% of white children are born today out of wedlock. Wow. Wow. That's enough. You get the point. It's really easy. I think it doesn't matter. It cuts across all racial lines. Here are my goals, you ready? Back to your notes, okay? Here are my goals. I want to give a balanced view of physical intimacy and its value in our lives. I want you to leave with a healthy view. I don't want you to be afraid of it or scared of it. I don't want that. Some of the books I read talked about how Christians have done a bad job of communicating about sex and they've made people afraid of it. And they made people shame. They shame people. People who have babies out of wedlock, you shame them. That's wrong. I love to ask the question, if you had babies for every time you um, fill in the blanks, how many would you have? Well said. There's something about... You still counting? Okay. So... <laughs> What, what I want you to do is I want you to think about how profoundly hypocritical it is to act like you don't understand. For me to act like I don't understand, that I'm some guy up here with some perfect life, and I don't understand, is wrong. It's hypocritical. You need to have a safe place where you can be honest about things. Money, your intimate life. You need those kind of people in your life where you can say, I am out of control. I know I'm out of control. I am not where I need to be. I spent all night, you know, you should be able to say this to somebody. I, on, on the internet, watching some poor, confused woman pretend and act to some man, pretend and act and get paid to lie to me. 
How did I get this way? This big mouth sitting up in my life that everybody can see. Can't even be trusted. Dear God, help us. That's the real issue. And my goal is to show a balanced view of that. And then secondly, to share wise insights from Paul's writings. Paul talks about this, and I'll share those in a minute. Third number three, my goal is to inspire families to take on the responsibility of this issue. It's not, it's not my responsibility. Let me just say this to you. This is not my job, totally. I mean, this is your job. This is, I'm, just, I'm a supplement, like a vitamin. But teaching your kids about this and talking to you about this, this is your job, your family's job. Grandmothers and grandfathers, this is your job. <clears throat> And if you don't do it, it becomes what it becomes. My job was to teach my kids. My job. If I see them off track, it's my job. Not the churches. The key, I'm going to show you the key mistakes Christians make. Boy, they make some amazing mistakes. And then I want to show you some wrong assumptions, too, that they make. Let me start with what Paul said, and, and I call this what unwise people don't understand about physical intimacy. So let me give you a list of things they don't understand. Number one, they, 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 they fail to see beyond skin. Say that with me, please. Come on. They, skin. they can't see beyond the skin. That's the, that's the term that's used in the message version of, of, of um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Here's what he says. There's more to physical intimacy or sex than mere skin, it says. It's more to it than that. The two literally become one. It's more than just skin. It's, it's more than that. And what you see in the commercials and in the music is all skin. I call it level one and two. So when I, when I interact with you, I am impressed with your skin, but I don't know you. I have no clue who you are. And let me tell you, guys especially are vulnerable to this. Our, our, our wiring, and, and God designed all this. You know, God designed stuff. You, you know, like you design a car, you design, he designed you to breathe. You just can't breathe underwater, right? You, you know, you, you're clear that just because you were designed this way doesn't mean that you need to act in ways that are unhealthy. And so I need to make sure that I'm clear that you're more than skin. Level one, level two, level three. I need to get to your what I call 12. The essence of who you are. There's more levels to a person than 12 levels, but I just wanted to make a point. I just chose 12 to make it, make it fun for me. I, I know you're 12. How many of you have sisters? You know they're 12? The essence of who they are? You know them? You know your sis? Right? No, a guy may meet her and think he knows her, but you really know her. Isn't that right? And when he, when, he gets, you know, when he gets around her for a while and gets over her hair and her look and all that, and you're going to say... It's the 12 there. <laughs> there is, <laughs> you, you, boy, you at seven now. You ain't there yet, son. You still got some more to go. And, and, and when you get to the 12, then you know how they act when they're feeling good, not feeling good, what scares them. You know not to even mention that because, you know, hey. And there's something about getting stuck at level one and two. That's why some of you stay with people like that. You always break up at level four. All they got to do is ask you about money. Ah, we're done. <laughs> you out. <laughs> Next, level one. Let's start all over again. And all your life, you kiss and hug and smooch on people and you think that's love. It's not love. That's not love at all. And I'll tell you about that in a minute, but please notice that's one of the things that, that I think unwise people don't understand. It's more than skin. Number two, they fail to see the long-term impact of physical intimacy. They don't see the long-term impact. Women can be prone to put, be tricked by this because they just believe they can fix her up or people. They can fix him up. And he looks good right now. But the long-term, they can forget about. They're not careful. Thirdly, and men, men are vulnerable to that too, but I think women have their own journey with that. Number three, they ignore the sacredness of our bodies. So number one, they fail to see beyond skin. Number two, they fail to see the long-term impact of their choices. And number three, they ignore the sacredness of their bodies. Here's what he said. Paul said this in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 6. He said, he who is joined to the Lord is joined as with is one spirit. He who is joined to the Lord is one 
spirit with him. Flee fornication. Flee sexual immorality. Flee sex outside of marriage. Call it what you want. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits what he calls in this, in this version, New King James Version, sexual immorality uh, are, 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 are sins against, against his own body. Can I just qualify something for a minute? When I say something is a sin, it's not like God saying, bad, bad, bad. That's not what that is. It's more than that. Here's what's a sin. Stepping in front of a train. <laughs> Why is that a sin? It hurts. Right? Here's a sin. Ready? Ready? Um, jumping into the water without knowing how to swim. Why? Why? Because you could drown. The reason he calls it a sin is because it hurts you. It harms you. It's not good for you. And here's what he says. That that action is, really works against you. Now, okay, you said, no, no, it's pretty fun. Okay, for a short term. But see, long term. You've tried it. Tell me how wonderful it is, has been. And tell, me, tell me the long-term outcomes. Tell me. I'm not, I mean, I'm not against it at all. I'm just simply making a point that there is something about, about this approach to life which Paul says isn't healthy. And then he goes on and says this. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body belongs to God. We forget that too. They ignore the fact that God owns their body. We're, we're like, he lives here. You're bought with a price, verse 20 says. Therefore glorify God in your what? Body and in your spirit. Are you with me so far? Let's say them again. Number one, number one, they failed to see beyond what? Skin. Number two, they failed to see the what? Long-term impact. Number three, they ignore the what? Second is their body. And number four, they ignore the fact that God owns what? Everything. Everything you have is leased. Everything you have is leased. Your clothes. Um, how many of you have... You move from, a, you live someplace else before you live where you live now. Okay, who lives there now? Somebody else. How many of you have a car, you had an old car, but it's gone now? Raise your hand, you have an old car? Okay, who's driving it now? See, somebody else. Everything you own, everything you, everything I'm on, somebody will get these bad shoes I got on. Somebody will get these one day. Not today, but they'll get them. Somebody will get this new suit. This is a brand. I never wore this suit. This is a brand new suit. Yes, it is, my friend. I like my suit. It's uh, what it is. It is what it is. Anyway, so, but, <laughs> but this suit will be given to somebody. It's leased. Every piece of clothing I've ever had has been given away. Your body is leased. It belongs to God. And everybody that I have buried, and I do it every week. I'm involved in some death once or twice a week, which is amazing in my life. But that has been amazing for me. There are key mistakes that Christians make when it comes to this whole subject. You ready? And here they are. First of all, they, they, they try to ignore intimate urges. They pretend they don't have them. So when something comes on them, you know, and they have a romantic or an intimate urge, they... they I bind the devil. I speak against this in Jesus' name. That's the devil. I cast it from me. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> and if you see somebody who's cute and they, you know, they, they're, they're level one or two impresses you, you go, I bind the devil. She's a devil. That's a devil. He's a devil. No. 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 That, that, that's, in my opinion, people who do that are prone to failure. Here's, here's the deal. They don't know the details. They don't understand how they work. You need to understand how your body works. You need to understand that, that it's normal to feel passion. It's normal to have those, those urges. That's not a wrong thing. It's, again, breathing underwater that's the problem. It's how I manage that. That's what this whole series is about. It's how I manage that. I am not trying to say you're a bad person, God doesn't love you. I'm not saying any of that. I'm simply saying this is not a good direction for you. Here's what you've done. You ready? You mislabel lust for love. You think that because I feel an urge or because I want to be with a person, that somehow that's love. That is not love. Here's what the Bible said love is. You ready? It gives it a very clear definition. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul said love is this. Suffers long, kind, 
does not envy, parades not itself, does get puffed up, does not behave rude, does not seek his own, not provoked. Are you climbing with me? Not provoked. Thanks no evil. You climb the ladder with me. Rejoices not in iniquity. Rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. That's love. Sounds like marriage, doesn't it? Sounds like dealing with a sibling, doesn't it? That's the stuff you deal with. Not level one and two and three. Level one and two and three is wonderful, but it's not where we stay. And if all we have is this, level one, two, and three, you've missed the point. Here's how you can know I'm right. The next time somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know, uh, I just feel it today. And, um, and I'd like to know if you'd like to, you know, kind of, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm going to tell you how you change the whole mood. Really? Now, now, now hear this right. Now hear what I'm saying. Hear this right. They, they're level one and two and three. All you have to do is raise the level of the conversation. So you understand that if we cross this bridge, it could be expensive. <laughs> what you talking about expensive? What they got to do with some? I'm talking about a moment. I ain't talking about no expenses. <laughs> you don't want to be patient with anybody. You don't want to bear anything, endure anything. You don't want to suffer anything. So I got a bad temper. I, I fight too. <laughs> See, you know what I'm saying? When you put all on the table, so I, I broke my last boyfriend arm. You know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> put, it, put it out there. Put it out there. Yeah. Just, just let her know. Say, the last woman I dated, I sued her. She'll get over your looks real fast. You sued her for what? I mean, once you, once you get past the, 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 the initial one and two, three levels, and, I th- and let me tell you something, I'm going to give you a hint. Don't date anybody that you're not tempted to lust after. Don't get nobody you don't, you don't, you're not tempted by. That's the wrong person. You need to feel something. What are you saying, Pat? I'm saying you need to feel like, you need to have to pray. That's how you kind of know, okay, I got to pray now. Mm-hmm. I, need, I saw them. I need to call up on Jesus. Can't remember the Bible too well. That's, that's a good sign. When I saw Diane, when I dealt with Diane, I'm like, what? What? Man, please. She was talking to me, and my mind left the Bible. <laughs> I couldn't make none of them Bible verses for a minute. <laughs> she came up and asked me a Bible question. She did. She kept it asking. I said, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Shall we pray, Father? Catch me now, God. I need your help. I'm glad you love it. Amen. It's the truth. There's something healthy about that. So I'm not trying to teach you. Christians get on my nerve with this act like you don't feel anything. What's wrong with you? You need to be tempted a little bit. You need to, you need to feel like you got to hold on. You need to have to pause. Okay, it's time to go. I got to leave right now. I got to leave this house in Jesus' name. If I don't, we won't make it. Praise God. Amen. I think that's a healthy thing. Can I get an amen, somebody? Here we go. You ready? All right. Here, here are the mistakes, right? They ignore. They, they, they try. These are mistakes Christians make. Number one, they, they try to ignore the intimate, the intimate urges. They, they don't know the details. They don't understand how they're wired physically. They, they never paid attention to health and science. They don't really understand sex at all. They, they don't. They watch too much television. They don't understand what they're doing to each other. Couples, when you deny each other intimacy, you don't really understand what you're doing to each other. You know, you, you, single people really don't get it. They, 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 sometimes it's all about an event, not a lifestyle. When you are married, it's a lifestyle. It's an, you, you, these events, you're event-driven, and, and you don't understand the power of, of, of well, I'll say more next week. Number three, they, they, mis, they mislabel feelings as love, right? Number four, they only talk it, about it with people who are uncomfortable with it, which is most church people. So you can't just talk. You have to apologize all the time. And then number six, they, they I'm sorry, number uh, five. Okay, thank you. They, that's when you get people sermon notes. They can help you, right? right? Number five, they avoid anyone who challenges their intimate views. Nobody can really say, hey, what are you doing? 
Number six, they pretend that being hyper-religious will remove all temptations. Just call upon Jesus. Hallelujah. I bind the devil. That ain't going to work. You know when it works? When nobody's around. <laughs> in church, it works real good. I put my foot on it. I declare in the name of Jesus. I will not. That's because nobody's here. But when you're by yourself and you know ain't nobody coming, you can't remember what Genesis is. Hyper religion doesn't work. Or right, here's the last one I'm saying. I'm done for the day. They pretend that being busy guarantees protection. So what churches do, they, they tie you up. Tuesday night prayer meeting, Wednesday night Bible study, Thursday night, Friday night evangelistic service, Saturday night Holy Ghost service, and then Sunday all day long. You're too tired to sin. You can't do nothing. You, just, you, you say, I ain't doing nothing. I ain't got no energy. Now. I, done, I, done, I done been in church. I done talked about Jesus all day. Oh, man, that's it. Woo. No, I can't come over. I'm too tired. Praise God. Okay. <laughs> but you know what people do? They just sin on Monday. Praise God. They just do it on Monday or Thursday. They do it on off days. That doesn't work. I'm preaching good. Put your stuff down. Stand on your feet. Come on. Stand on. Come on. Stand on your feet. Got to get you out of here. We make assumptions that are wrong. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not giving you some magic pill. I'm simply saying, please at least leave here with one thought. I wanna, I'm, I, I, he's right. I need to deal with this issue in my life. Because here's the big deal. Here's the big deal. Can you be trusted? That's what the word of the Lord to me was at 17 years old. In a season of struggle when I was deciding whether I was going to go left or right, I had been serving Jesus for a couple of years and was deciding, and I remember... In that moment, in that season, man, will I be Pastor Rick or not? I didn't know I was deciding that. But here's what the word of the Lord came to me. If you don't get a handle on your flesh, on the sexual, in, your sexual attitude, here's what will happen. You will not be trusted. The question is, can you be trusted? I'm always honored when my wife will say, here's a young girl that I, that I think she should hear from you because she's going through a season. A time or two she's, she's done that a few number of times. And, and, and I, I just I thought, what an incredible thing that my wife would trust me with a younger woman and know I'm safe. Or that a father would come to me and say, my daughter's going off to school. Can, I give, can, can you give her your number to call you sometimes? And they call me. Wow. Wow. I was in, um, I was in Texas the other day. <laughs> I went to, a, I went to a, a, a country western concert with my daughter she wanted to see Rascal Flatts so I took her and um, while I was there a couple of girls who've been in our church just heard I was in the area so they sent me a text hey I heard you were nearby sorry I missed you this time I thought what an incredible thing safe 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 it's not just men women come on girl come on girl you teacher come on now come on what are you doing sister girl you're not safe you can I tell a story I've never told this. I was somewhere. I, was, I said this. I was somewhere. I was somewhere. And um, this cute girl, this real cute girl, was there. And she just caught your eye. You know, she just caught my, just caught my eyes. Oh, boy, she's, she, she's cute. If she's cute, she's cute, right? You have to lie and say everybody ugly in Jesus' name. No, this is a person. 
God did a good job on this person. I mean, you know. And this person, um, I didn't say a word. I didn't, I didn't say anything. I just, you know, I, I just stayed straight. Hey, God bless you. And I walked away. And later on, this person called my office. I didn't know it was them. And they shared some of the most horrendous stories. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was horrible. I won't even repeat it. It was horrible. And when I saw her, I said, God, I thank you. I'm safe. Because I don't need to be on that list. I need to be the place she can come and say, here, this is my story. Lift your hand with me. Father, help us to be safe people who honor you, who deal with the real issue in our life, the sexual issue in our life. They say sometimes now the average time you go intimate with somebody is after two dates. Three dates, you're sometimes the first date, but the average is two or three dates. What in the world? We're putting our future, our finances, our foundation all at risk. We're out of control. Help us, God. Help us, Jesus. I ask you, God, to touch hearts today. Touch lives. To somebody here doesn't know you, Savior, let this be the moment they say, Pastor Rick, what you said spoke to me. And I ask Jesus to come into my heart and life. I ask him to let this be my new day. I ask him to let this be that time when my life changes forever. I come to Jesus and ask him to save me and forgive me for my life and my past. I surrender my life to Jesus today. And I give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when you hear the word of God and it inspires you, you have a chance to decide to change. You can hear a message and just hear it, or you can hear a message and apply it to your life. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray what they've heard today is something that they can put in their shoes and allow it to impart blessing and guidance to their life. I thank you for the power of your word and how it can change lives. And we invite you, Lord God, to take this message and change the direction of their life. In Jesus' name. My name is Ricky Temple. I pray you were blessed by it today. I'll see you next time right here as we study the word together. 